Good morning. We uh, read the first portion of Psalm chapter 37, verses 1 to 22, a little earlier in the service, and we're going to continue in Psalm 37, reading from verse 23 all the way to the end of the chapter. The steps of a man are established by the Lord, and he delights in his way. When he falls, He will not be hurled headlong, because the Lord is the one who holds his hand. I have been young, and now I am old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, or his descendants begging bread. All day long he is gracious and lends, and his descendants are a blessing. Depart from evil and do good, so that you will abide forever. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his godly ones. They are persevered forever, but the descendants will be, of the wicked will be cut off. The righteous will inherit the land and dwell in it forever. The mouth of the righteous utters wisdom, and his tongue speaks justice. The law of his God is on his heart. He step, his steps do not slip. The wicked spies upon the righteous and seeks to kill him. The Lord will not leave him in his hand, or let him be condemned when he is judged. Wait for the Lord, and keep his way, and he will exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, you will see it. I have seen wicked, violent men spreading himself like a luxuriant tree in its native soil. Then he passed away, and lo, he was no more. I sought for him, but he could not be found. Mark the blameless man, and behold the upright. For the man of peace will have posterity, but the transgressors will be altogether destroyed. The posterity of the wicked will be cut off. But the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them, because they Take refuge in him. Having read through the entire chapter of Psalm 37, there are quite a few applications that you and I can implement to our lives. Although this psalm finds itself just 37 chapters into the book, it is actually one of the psalms that David wrote later and very much near the end of his life. And it is laden with the learned wisdom of one who has lived a full, a full and very uh, effective life. It stands in contrast to some of the other psalms that are written in a style that, in a style that might be more emotional or that where the reader hears how David worshipped or worked through trials or outcried to God in trouble. Instead, it is written more in a style of that that we might equate with the Proverbs. Uh, And this is because it pictures David as a man who has lived his years and is now passing down the life information that he finds most vital. He wants to inform the next generation underneath him of how to live well for the Lord and the key things that are part of living well for the Lord. Now, um, the question remains though, what are these key principles that David puts forward in the psalm? And how should these principles influence our daily walk with the Lord? Well, the first principle that we learn is that we must not fear or be envious of evildoers. For We read in the very beginning of Psalm 37, Do not fret because of evildoers. Do not be envious toward wrongdoers, for they will wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herb. Now, this principle has two different components to it. Firstly, let's address fretting and fearing. When we as Christians look around and look at the world, we at times fear because so much around us seems to be unstable. 
Wars, viruses, stock market crashes, riots, murders, and all types of evil are plastered in front of us by various mediums such as TV, internet, newspaper, and radio. The entire world seems to be overrun by evil as governments across the world throw more, more and more hateful laws up against Christianity. We fear for our religious freedom and we fear for the type of world that our children may have to grow up in. Now, a certain amount of fear is a healthy thing for it protects us from taking unnecessary risks and it keeps our mind alert and active. However, there is a point where fear starts to become overwhelming and it affects our hearts and minds and the spiritual relationship we have with God. David himself was no stranger to fear for he was at many times running for his life and he had to trust in God wholly while he was doing that running. But the question remains, why do we fear though? I think a large portion of it has to do with what we consume and what thoughts we allow to become preeminent in our minds, especially, uh, and especially a major influencer of our thoughts and minds today is the media that we take in on a daily basis. We as Christians ought to be very cautious of the messages that we are allowing into our hearts and minds. Never in the history of man has there been the ability for media and, and radio and TV to work its way into our homes where they can, they can influence our thoughts, our hearts and our minds. And never has there been a point where there has been this ability to build a sense of anxiety and fear in, uh, and trepidation of the world in the hearts of believers. Now, I think I'm just as much at fault as anybody for listening to these fearful voices too much. I personally am a person that likes to keep really up to date with what is going on in the world. But, as I've searched myself and as I've consumed more media and TV shows and talk media about what's going on in the world, I've slowly found myself more fearful of the future, angry at the world, and more riled up about things that, frankly, I can't control whatsoever. They're out of my hands. Being informed of what's happening in the halls of parliament or, uh, or what's happening on a daily basis in our society is one thing, but when these perspectives dominate our thoughts and all we can think about is how the world is going wrong, we let the world's fear start to take captive our lives. This is because fear in its very nature is a perpetual downward cycle that continually feeds upon itself. Now, this can be expressed in an example of a child's fear of the dark. Now, it's not normally the dark itself that makes children afraid, but rather it is the uh, imagination of that child that causes them to be afraid. Take, for example, little Bill. He's being tucked into bed at night and his parents, uh, his parents close the door and turn off the light and Bill's imagination starts turning. Now, he's thinking about all the possibilities of monsters just hiding out of view. Now, these monsters may all be imaginary, but to Bill, they are very real. The creaking of the house cooling down sounds like a footstep. The wind whistling a monster's breath. Soon, Bill is running to his parents' bedroom so that they can protect him from the terror he has unleashed upon himself. Now, in some senses, we as adults don't get out of that mentality that children have with fear. Now, it is true that in this world, there are many terrors, plenty of monsters as well. But in the scope of eternity, these happenings in the world, which get covered by the news continually, are, mere, are merely the imaginary monsters that plagued Bill's mind. Sure, they do indeed have an actual effect on us in the here and now, but 
in the scope of all eternity. These fears that the world tries to instill in us are not even to be considered of or worthy of any value. Now, I'm not saying that we have to be brash and uncaring about the value of life or, or, uh, or that it's wrong to so, show sympathy for those who are genuinely in a panicked state about the world. But rather, it is vital that we as Christians view things from an eternal perspective. This is why the Bible tells us in Philippians 4, 7, it says that we would hold the peace of God which surpasses all understanding or comprehension. The same things that make the world crouch and, and, and cower in fear, we can laugh at because even death itself has been swallowed up in victory by Christ and his works. The problem is that all too often, we allow the news of evil and evildoers to cloud the daily Christian joy that we should hold and possess. This is why David repeats this call to stay away from fear and anger. For he says, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil doing. For evildoers will be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord will inherit the land. This brings me to my second point. Fear and anger often come hand in hand. And anger can draw us into ourselves and into fighting our own battles. Often when we fear, we become more concerned about the world's issues that we see around us than the concern that we have for the eternal gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to be fully transparent in this. I, at times, have been guilty of this myself. I am young. I'm passionate. And at times, the, uh, and at times the emotions can stir me, and I can feel very stirred about what is happening in this world. For how can one not be angry about some of the bills that get passed in Parliament that are blatantly against what, by, what, what God's Word teaches? Now, I'm not saying that it is a sin to be angry. There is a certain place for righteous justice and righteous anger. However, the central issue here is that not that we might get angry with what is happening in the world, but rather it is not wise to partake in a steady diet of media that uh, stirs up this fear and this anger and this emotion within us until we are so bothered by everything that it deprives us of our God-given joy. We must come to terms with the fact that we really cannot do anything of our own accord which will turn this world around. For it is only by transformed hearts and minds and by the power of God that anything can be made of this terrible world. You may ask then, how do we counter the world's fear? Well, a good place to start is by turning off the world's message highway. Try to turn off the TV and put down the newspaper, not watching the latest show on YouTube which focuses on the newest world tragedy out. There's a new one every 24 hours, it seems. The Word of God tells us really all we need to know about the depravity of the human heart. And anything that we see on the screen is just more evidence proving that the Bible is indeed true. So instead, if you feel anxious about the world around you or fearful about what is happening in the world, take up the Bible and read about the eternal promises that God has given you. Read on the hope that we have in the kingdom of God and God's ultimate victory over evil. Allow the peace which surpasses all understanding to, to uh, permeate your mind and dwell in your soul for we know that our God is faithful and no matter what happens here on this earth that in the end the Lord's plans will come to full fruition. In, a, in fact in Isaiah 41 10 God states to the Israelites do not fear 
for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. This is exactly what David meant when he said in Psalm 37, 25, when he said, I have been young and now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken. So do not fear, for you have the sovereign Lord on your side. This uh, leads me to the third point that I want to take from this passage, and that is that the same eternal thinking that David mentions is so important is also important for applying to our lives as a whole. Throughout Psalm 37, there are calls for the reader to stay away from the wicked and not do evil for personal gain. For the wicked and their, and their deeds and their accomplishments will fade away in short, he re David repeats again and again that we must not be envious of wrongdoers. Now, what David says in this chapter uh, can also be expanded past simply wrongdoers, but it also encompasses the entire world because we know from reading the Bible that the entirety of humanity is fallen short of the glory of God. Let's start off with an illustration, very similar to the one that David mentions in Psalm 37. Picture a particular individual sitting and eating. He has lived his life to the full. He has enjoyed and experienced all the luxuries of this world, from fine cars like Ferraris to nice boats and fantasy watches and Rolexes. He's eaten the best meals and all the food that one could imagine. He currently sits down happily with a spread of lobster, steak, and caviar. All the while, the righteous person is sitting outside the house with a bowl of oatmeal. Now, the righteous man with a bowl of oatmeal may feel jealous of this man with plenty. The righteous one may ask God, why is this fair? And why does the one who does not love the Lord obtain all things enviable in this world, while the righteous one, who lives rightly, follows the law, and gives of himself, is poor? At this question, God reveals to the righteous man that the unrighteous man, who has been, who has been seen for having so much, is in reality consuming his last requested meal before being sentenced to death. He is merely minutes away from an execution chamber. And the Lord turns to the righteous man and he asks the righteous man, is the position of the worldly man now so enviable? I think this scene is often how we as Christians can get deceived into seeing the world we can be easily captivated by the various joys and be tempted to envy those who put trust in material things. However, the Bible provides us the, pull, the full picture of what is really happening. All the things in this world and all the things that people may possess, all its luxuries are but merely a final meal before capital judgment for those that only put their trust in the world. For those who only trust in the world, this world is the absolutely best thing that they will ever experience. In the short 80 or so years that they live, this is all that they will ever get. And then poof, it'll be gone. It'll disappear. That will be that. And now, I know this world does provide some pretty great experiences, and there are some pretty neat things to own and eat and go to, but in all reality, they are nothing compared to the possible the possibility of eternal life. The short time we spend on this world is absolutely nothing compared to eternity. Now, I am not saying that we can't enjoy life. Please, do not get me wrong on this. God made many beautiful and wonderful things for us to enjoy. 
He gave us minds for invention so that we can feel the hair of our of our heads swirl as the wind blows through it as we drive down the highway in a convertible. Now, I don't have a convertible, but I think it would be a pretty nice feeling. <laughs> so, but, so this in itself is not bad. In fact, it is very good. But when our desire for worldly things at, such as this turn to envy, and we wish for more than what God has granted us, and we take hold of the world more closely than we take hold of God and his word, we're not viewing the world through the eternal perspective that God desires us to view it through. So then practically, what is to be done? How do we apply this principle to our lives? Well, when we see the world, we must not envy the things of this world or try to follow in the ways of the wicked so that we may obtain or gain material success. We know from God's word that all will fade away and that the only thing that will remain is our faith in the Lord and those treasures which we have stored up in heaven by serving him daily. It is not wrong to want something or to, desi or to desire something. But that desire does become wrong if it becomes greater than our desire for God. And in that, and if that desire grows, then we become just like the rest of the world. David's warning against this illicit envy or lust for the possessions of this world or the possessions of wrongdoers rings true just as much today as it did 3,000 years ago. Now, this leads us to the fourth primary point in the passage, and that is on the temporariness of life. It is true that the former two warnings, don't fear and don't envy, are very common throughout this chapter. But perhaps even more prevalent is the statement of judgment that God will enact upon those who follow the path of this world. Six times David mentions the downfall of the wicked. He says, they will wither quickly like the grass, and they will fade away like the green herb, that they will be cut off, or that their sword shall enter their own heart, or that the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord will be like the glory of the pastures. They vanish like smoke. They vanish away. Much of this language that David uses in the Psalms is to exemplify the judgment of the wicked and it communicates the temporal nature of our state. It is not forever. It is passing. The feeling of the temporary is then, is then compared to the life which God offers for the righteous. This is what I want to stress on for the rest of this message. David was an old man by the time he wrote the psalm. And by that time, he started to realize the true value of things in this life. Throughout the psalm, the reader, or, or David encourages the reader to depart from evil and do good so that you will abide forever. But the verse that Brest expresses how this is accomplished is given in verses three to four, which says, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, this perhaps is one of the mis most misused verses in the Bible. All too often, this verse is used to tell the Christian that if they just trust God enough, that God will give them whatever they want in this world. And it saddens my heart greatly that this verse is so often twisted in that manner. For if that were true, then this verse would directly contradict David's other statements in the chapter about not envying the wrongdoers or taking stock in this fading, finite world. The question really is then, is God an infinite means to a finite end? Or is he an infinite means to an infinite end. 
Those who would take this verse and use it to decry that God will give us health, wealth, and prosperity are missing out on the most important aspect of how God's transformative power works in the heart of man. You see, when man tr fully trusts in the Lord and does good and follows his law, the Lord starts a work in the heart and in the mind of the believer, taking it from a mind that is focused on the flesh and then transforming it into one that is focused on the heavenly or eternal things. The more a Christian trusts in God and follows him, the more they start to delight in the presence of God. Every hour of the day starts to become ever brighter as we come to the realization that the God of the universe stepped down from heaven to reveal himself to us and enter into a relationship with his creation. We become overwhelmed by his great love for us as our hearts are transformed. And as our hearts are transformed, so too are our desires. Now, our desires will not be as they once were focused on the fear of living in this world or in envy of worldly things, but rather we will desire to be in an ever-growing and ever-deeper relationship with our Lord and Savior. This new desire which comes out of loving God is the one that will always, always be fulfilled. For the one that puts their trust in God will have the reward in him. And that reward is eternally dwelling in his presence, the one whom they love. God is the greatest fulfillment of our desires because he is the greatest good possible. He is the greatest fulfillment that we can ever possibly have in this life. No other thing in this world can even compare to it. Well, that then remains and gives us the question, how, though, do we obtain this desire for God? How do we transform our hearts and our minds? How do we work to achieve this? And this, too, is good news. For in Psalm 37, if we read verses 39 and 40, David's, D David writes, <clears throat> But the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. In conclusion, this eternal outlook, the desire for God, the shunning of the fear and the anger of this world, and the reward for knowing God is held out for us as a gift of grace. God offers his salvation to the righteous, to each of us, through his son Jesus Christ. Even David in the Old Testament knew that it was only by God's strength and mercy that he could find ultimate peace. He, the mighty warrior, could not fight himself to freedom. He couldn't stand on his own and, and achieve the peace of this life. But the salvation of the righteous was from the Lord and the Lord alone. In the same manner, Christ has saved us from the death row of this world. And he has delivered us from evil. God calls us to a relationship with him freely so that we may find our desire in him and come to know him more and more each day until the fullness of eternity. This is what it means to truly have hope in this life, to find true peace and to rest and be, and be peaceful amongst a troubled an angry and fearful world, a fearful world that we live in every day. This is where we as Christians can rest, and it is so good to rest in God and in God alone, for the reward is eternity. Let's close in prayer. 
Dear Lord, I pray that you would work in our hearts and lives as we walk through this life. Help us to take to heart David's advice that we would not become afraid of this world or angry at what is happening around us, but rather that we may place our hope and trust fully in you. God, we ask that we would not try to obtain this peace out of our own strength, but we would, that we would allow you to lift us up in your great salvation as we humbly submit ourselves to you, that you, by the power of your Spirit, would work in our hearts and minds so that we would see your fullness and, and pursue you with everything that we have. May our desire only be for you, and may we experience your fullness and goodness each day more and more until eternity. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.